Ladies and gentlemen, I now welcome the man with a significant, unique, and very warm voice, Jose James. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, Jose. Hey. Hello, <laughs> good evening. Everybody. <sighs> well, yeah. first of all, <laughs> welcome to Berlin. Thank you. Let's talk about Billie Holiday first. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, we just heard in the film that she's been one of your musical mothers, or even the musical mothers. Yeah. Mother. So why? Why? I just think uh, when you think of a mother, you think of sometimes your childhood, somebody who took care of you, um, somebody who, you know, you go to when you're in need, who has answers, or uh, at least makes you feel better about the world. And Billie Holiday has been that artist for me, you know, like if I'm feeling sad about my life or, you know, the music business or kind of anything, I can always go home and put on a Billie Holiday album and I just, it's like a warm bath, you know, it's like, oh yeah, relax. You know, she went through way, 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 way worse stuff than, than you. She came out like a star, an uh, artist, you know, and it just like immediately shifts my perspective. Mm. Um, you know, besides that, she taught me everything I know about, about jazz, about how to be around jazz musicians. You know, you, there's a famous clip of her sitting on a stool you know, TV, in a TV station and with all the famous jazz musicians around her singing fine and mellow. And she's one of the musicians, you know, and you can tell how much they respect her. And I always wanted to be that kind of, uh, that kind of singer for myself. Jose, your new album is dedicated to her. Yesterday I had the blues, the music of Billie Holiday. That's the title of the new album. So you just said she had a big impact on your music, on your way of singing. Can you maybe explain to us what does it mean exactly? Yeah, well, you know, you hear different styles and when you're young and impressionable, you don't know anything, so you're searching, you know. So, you know, I would hear Ella, you know, oh, ba, 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 da, da, da. oh, lady, be so good to me, you know what I mean? Bright and like exciting. Um, And then Billy comes along and she's like, good morning, how day. Yeah. Oh, miss that, you know? And she and talks like, a lot in her voice. Yeah, itself, it's almost she? like she's, you know, it's almost like she's talking to herself on this deep level. And I was like, wow, this is really different, you know? And uh, I got drawn into it, you know, by the the sensuality, because for me, the most important people um, have really been the tenor sax players. You know, I really loved Lester Young, and I really loved um, Coleman Hawkins and John, John Coltrane. Coltrane yeah. And I would hear her, you know, listening as I would a sax player, and hear her do all these cool things melodically, but very inside, like she wasn't showing off. And I said, wow, like, this is special, and you know, I want to figure out what she's doing. Mm -hmm. So what kind of songs did you choose for your new album? I mean, were there any criteria for you? Well, I wanted to do things that felt um, respectful to her and also to our connection. You know, I didn't want to sing uh, songs that were sort of like me showing off, like, oh, look how much I know about Billie Holiday, you know, like rare cuts or something. I wanted to show... Uh, Not anything about her per se, but what she has done for me. I think that's the only thing I could show in this album. How much she's influenced me as a singer and as an artist and as a, as a man. Because um, there's a certain kind of vulnerability in her music that you don't necessarily find in jazz. And for me, that was the challenge is like, can I be that vulnerable? Can I be that open? Um, and that's, that was the criteria, you know. I did songs like Tenderly, songs like Lover Man, songs where you're kind of going out on a limb and saying like, I'm out here, I'm feeling all this stuff for you, maybe for the first time. Uh, it's a vulnerable position to be in. I don't know how it's going to end up, but I'm sort of going with it, you know. And you know, as we know from Billie Holiday's life, 
in our own lives, things don't always work out the way Absolutely. we want. And then the challenge is kind of like, how do you pick yourself up and dust yourself off and keep going? So that, that was the approach, you know, and, and there's certain core songs um, in Billie Holiday's repertoire that had to be there. Strange Fruit, of course. It's the um, last song on yeah. the CD, a very strong song itself. And you do it without any instruments, you just sing it. So um, tell us about the approach towards the song. What did you think about it? And why mm. did you perform it like this? Well, I felt like um, there was no use in doing it with the piano because Billy had done that. Nina Simone had done that. You know, they're like, you know, it's, gonna, it's the best it's ever going to be, you know? And I always felt like, when you perform that song or when you hear somebody do that song, it should feel devastating. You know, it should feel really emotional and deep. And I started experimenting with a loop station at, at my house, um, just messing around. And I found this line that was kind of like a cello line, you know, just And I started building off that, you know, And then I found a kind of jazz harmony to go with it. And when I put that together, I still have the original on my loop station, the, the writing track. I was like, wow, that's actually something kind of like John Coltrane would do, minimal, minimize a song to like one chord and then perform over that chord. Uh, and I tried it with Strange Fruit and it totally worked. So I'm just by myself at home kind of getting mesmerized because with the loop station, you keep adding parts and pieces and you're working with headphones. So I was like in this kind of trance and it really took me somewhere. Like it took me all the way back to the times of slavery. And I kind of felt like this uh, field holler, you know, chain gang that, wah, mm, wah, you know? And so I started layering that up, and it was it, like really exciting, you know, and, and it felt really emotional. And um, I knew that was, that was the, the impact I wanted to have, because it was impacting me. I was feeling sad about it, you know. It's a very strong interpretation, I have to say. Um, you, just before you talked about um, how she influenced you as an artist, as a singer, as a man talking about being a man, Jose. Um, <laughs> that's another thing that is so special about the album, that a man sings Billie Holiday. What does it make with her words, with her music, mm. um, with the singing itself? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating experience for me because I feel like women are so much better at expressing uh human relationships and, and emotions you know um so it was nice to sort of not have to feel like uh you know i have to be a man i have to be tough about stuff it was like no this is the opposite this is you being totally open and uh there's something there's something scary about that but there's something Why? very just because um you know it was already daunting to cover Billie Holiday. You know, I knew it had to be really great, otherwise people, because Billie Holiday is very special. You know, she's not your everyday singer. Like people who love Billie Holiday, like myself, really love Billie Holiday and are very protective of her, as they should be. So anybody who kind of does a cover and it, it's not that great, you're like, oh man, you, it's not only bad, you've kind of like tarnished her image in a way. You know what I mean? So I had that pressure and also, um, you know, just wanting to kind of feel honest about, about who I was with these songs. And uh, especially songs that she's really known for, like God Bless the Child. And in that way, I really have to give uh, credit to the band, especially Jason Moran, for really helping me. It's the piano player. Yeah, the pianist Jason Moran helping me you know, really frame um, the songs in a way that felt really fresh, but gave me so much space to explore at the same time. 
So as we saw in the film, you tried a lot before recording, as I understood, didn't you? Um, well, it's funny because I spent a long time preparing for this session, but the entire album was done in four hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, with the band. Quite quick. Yeah, and then the next day I did uh, Strange Fruit by myself. It was one of those like magic, magic sessions that maybe happens once in your lifetime where everybody comes together, you know, without much preparation and magic things happen. I mean, you can see in the, in the video, everyone's laughing and smiling and having a great time. And literally, we started tracking at one o'clock and we finished at four. And I said to Don, like, great, what's next? And he said, that's it, <laughs> go home. <laughs> I was totally shocked. Like, it was like coming out of a dream. We were like, wow, that's, what do you mean that's it? And he was like, yeah, you're done. And what did you think when you um, listened to it the first time? I thought Afterwards. it was amazing. Because I really felt it was amazing at the time. It was way better than I thought it was going to be, honestly. Um, because that trio ha has never played together before as a unit. And I just had this idea of how it could sound, and it was way beyond um, all my expectations, honestly. Great. Yeah. So there's your own album, and then you compiled an album with Billie Holiday songs, sang by her own, called God Bless the Child, Best of Billie Holiday. What kind of songs did you choose for this? Well, to be honest, they're just kind of my favorites, you know. Um, I feel like it, it was really difficult doing a compilation because she recorded for a lot of different labels in a lot of different periods. So I really focused on some of her output from Verve in the later part of her life. Uh, it's a time of her life that Miles Davis said he'd prefer hearing her then because even though she had lost a bit of her technical voice, she had gained a world of experience. So everything she says has this weight and import. And you know, she just sounds like this regal queen, you know, like a Maria Callas or somebody who just really like in control and in command, you know. Jose, with what kind of music did you grow up actually? Oh man, everything. You know, I mean, my mom uh, played a lot of jazz and a lot of, you know, so I was born in 1978, so she had a lot of 70s, 60s and 70s albums. She liked a lot of uh, folk music, Peter, Paul and Mary. She liked the Ohio Players. She liked uh, Grover Washington Jr., stuff like that. And you know, as I, you know, came of age, it was amazing because it was the golden age of hip hop, you know, so as a young child, um, I had like NWA and Public Enemy. I mean, I remember uh, in school, in about like seventh grade, there was an NWA tape going around, you know, the school. We'd pass it around, <laughs> a cassette tape, you know, and we'd all like hide, because your parents, you know, you weren't supposed to have it, and we'd all like secretly listen to it one night and give it to someone else. Um, and then, you know, like De La Soul and uh, A Tribe Called Quest, Beastie Boys, and. From that point on, it just was like every month, every year, there was like a, a brand new groundbreaking um, artist coming out, you know, Nirvana, 10,000 Maniacs, Soundgarden. It was just like, wow, I couldn't believe that um, all this stuff was happening, you know, and I feel really lucky to, to have experienced that, um, that moment in, in musical history and also you know, to have that experience of, of waiting at the record shop, you know, like for the new Taleb Kweli album, you know, you want to get it before everybody else. I mean, it was cool. And, you know, through listening to, to jazz, to, to hip hop, I started hearing this sound and I was like, wow, it's, it, there's something deeper in the track. You know, it would be like an upright bass or a piano sample in Nas or something different, you know, and I couldn't quite figure out what it was. So I started reading the liner notes And I noticed in the production credits, it would say sample courtesy of this label and like Roy Ayers or Miles Davis or something. So I was like, oh, who's Roy Ayers? I had no idea, you know. So I'd go to the record shop and say, hey, do you know anything about Roy Ayers? And they're like, yeah. And they'd send me to this jazz section, which was enormous. You know, it was this record store called the Electric Fetus in Minneapolis. 
and everything was alphabetical. And I remember going to the Miles Davis section for the first time, and uh, it was so enormous. It was immense. It was like a whole, just shelves and shelves and shelves. And I couldn't believe one artist had, had made, you know, 50 albums. <laughs> and I'm the looking. I remember, moment in Yeah, you life. know. And, and I pull one out, and I look at the back, and it has four tracks on it. And each track is 18 minutes long, you know. And I'm thinking, like, I can't listen to this. You know what I mean? I want value. I wanted, like, I was looking for the one that had 12 tracks on it, you know? <laughs> But by now, you listen to it, I yeah. guess. Yeah, <laughs> and I just fell in love with, with jazz, like, immediately. I thought, wow, this is so cool, because they didn't teach me about jazz in school. It's not, it's not a secret in the U.S., but it's, it's not, like, popular mm -hmm. in schools you yeah, know you i was discovered in it. yeah so i felt like That's the coolest right. kid in school like i knew about charles mingus no one else knew about him <laughs> yeah. culture exactly yeah. jose and when did you decide to become a musician and uh, finally a singer Well, that's a good question. You know, my voice changed when I was 14. That's very normal. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I had this deep voice. And I don't, somebody said, well, you should join a choir. You should sing. You know, I don't even remember who. And I was going to a Catholic high school. And so we had, uh, like, Vivaldi church music and things like that. So I was singing classical music. And I really enjoyed it. Um, and the best thing about choir was it was pretty much all girls. So that was awesome. So it hooked me in right away, <laughs> that's, you know. That's and why you became a singer. Yeah, kind of, you know, <laughs> to be honest. Like, I wasn't uh, tall enough to play basketball. And, uh, you know, if you're not playing basketball or doing something cool, girls aren't interested. So, you know, <laughs> singing was a very cool way to, to meet ladies. Yeah. Also nowadays, I guess. Well, now, you know, now it's a different story. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it another time. Okay. Dear Jose, your first city was called The Dreamer, and um, with songs you wrote and composed by yourself, and the title had be a dedication to Martin Luther King, and um, your second album title had been Black Magic, so how important has it been to you to make a political statement with your music? Well, I think um, all music and all art is inherently political. It's a social statement, whether or not it's expressed overtly or not. You know, um, I think just the act of saying, I want to live my life as an artist and as a full-time creator is a, a very different choice in society. And It's, that's, a, that's a statement in and of itself. But, you know, for me, I really admire the history of expression in black music, you know, going all the way back to the blues and gospel, talking about the search for spirituality and the, the battle between, uh, you know, Saturday night and Sunday morning, you know <laughs> what I mean? Um, so that was, that was very interesting. I mean, for me, it's... it's It's less interesting to hear artists talk about uh, kind of overt political messages. It's more interesting uh, to hear a personal narrative. You know, The Dreamer, for example, was about how um, Martin Luther King Jr. had affected me as a kid and how interwoven jazz was with the civil rights movement. I didn't want to do a, like a, a whole thing hitting people over the head with all that information. So I just titled it The Dreamer from Martin Luther King. You know what I mean? Duke Ellington always did it in a way that was like very subtle. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of felt like that's the way that I wanted so to. So it leaves place or space for associations, actually. Yeah. And on the other hand, there is always space for um, anger and, and, you know, extreme expression. You know, I definitely listen to a lot of Max Roach um, and his like, you know, Freedom Now, We Insist with Abby Lincoln and Jazz with Charles Mingus, Fables of Fathers, um, and then Ice Cube and, you know, right up to today, um, you know, Kendrick Lamar and people like that. Um, it, you know, it's important to, 
use music as a platform to speak about the issues that are meaningful to you. Yeah. Yeah. Jose James, our guest tonight here in the Apple Store with his new album. Yesterday I had the blues, the music of Billie Holiday. Maybe you have some questions for Jose. Take the opportunity. We have a microphone going on here. So uh -oh. who's got a question? This lady. Welcome. Thanks. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I just wonder, besides Billie Holiday, is there an Emeo vocalist who inspired you, you used to listen to? Uh, great question. I would say the number one male vocalist is Marvin Gaye. Yeah. And there's a, actually a very interesting connection between the two of them. Um, and that's Lester Young, the famous tenor saxophone player. He was a good friend of Billie Holiday's, and they, they taught each other about music and created this whole jazz scene in Harlem together. And then, obviously, years later, Marvin was on Motown, and he was having a lot of difficulty because they were producing him in a way he, where he had to like sing really hard in keys that were uncomfortable. And he was really frustrated one day, and he came home from a session, and he put on a Lester Young album, and he said, in that moment, it was like, he got it. He was like, just relax, man. Like, lay back, let it happen. You don't have to push. And in that moment, that's when you actually start to hear the Marvin Gaye that we think of today, who sings so softly and is so cool and behind the beat. So it's kind of interesting. I didn't know that before. Um, I just figured that out like two years ago. Yeah. Do you have another question for Jose James, our guest? Yes, please. Hi, Jose. Um, I'm very happy that you're here tonight. Um, Thank you. Could you tell us uh, what we th will be your next project or next album? <laughs> or which direction will we will get? That's one go? question I had secrets. to actually. Thank <laughs> you so much. Um, well, I'm considering a couple different things. Uh, a project I'm working on now is uh, I'm, I'm looking at the Blue Note catalog. Like for me right now, it's it's a very interesting time to be on a historic jazz label. You know, the most historic jazz label. And working with Don Wes as yeah. well. Yeah, and Don really brings like a different perspective. He sort of gives artists like myself or Robert Glasper complete freedom to interpret that history or react against it as we feel. Uh, in an honest way. So what I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm looking through kind of lesser known Blue Note stuff, like from the 1970s. Uh, a lot of really funky stuff by like Eddie Henderson uh, and Donald Byrd and Ronnie Laws and people like that. Really cool, like funky break beats. And a lot of that kind of stuff has only been heard in hip hop, like Nas and Cypress Hill have sampled a lot of that stuff. But there's literally hundreds of albums that have kind of been unexplored. Um, there's actually a really great uh, playlist that's out there that you can check out all this stuff on Bluno, but um, I'm kind of looking at that and, and seeing if there's a way to combine that somehow with contemporary R&B. You know, I'm really into like Drake and Miguel and Frank Ocean and people like that. So I'm sort of seeing if there's some kind of way to bring all these worlds together um, within jazz. And I have a strong feeling Robert Glasper is gonna be involved in that project too. Sounds good. Let's talk about touring. I mean, you were touring a lot. Does it make a difference to you to perform in Europe or in the US? Um, I mean, there's definitely a, a difference and I enjoy both. Um, it's funny because I started on Brownswood, which is a UK label run by Giles Peterson, the famous DJ. So my first experience was really Who in... really supported you. Yeah, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, my first experience was really in the UK. And then he introduced me to, you know, France and to Benelux. And I spent a lot of time in Europe. So in, a, in an interesting way, I almost feel more comfortable performing in Europe because I've spent more time here. I've been touring here since like 2006. And it's actually only until maybe my album, No Beginning, No End, where I got to play on like Conan O'Brien and David Letterman and things like that, where um, I started playing the US a lot more. 
You know, the thing that I find different about the U.S. and, and European markets is in Europe, people seem to value the art in a different way. Like if you're not necessarily the biggest seller, but you're doing something people think is very valuable, and critics kind of say, well, this is interesting, then you have opportunities to perform at festivals and meet people, and people want to figure out. In the U.S., it seems like there's a lot more kind of um, machinery involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and there's also, to be fair, a lot more competition, mm -hmm. you know. So it's harder to get your your voice out there, and it's also insanely huge, you know. Uh, okay. So doing a tour in the U.S. is like three could, times Europe. Yeah, it could be <laughs> it could be uh, difficult, you know. I mean, it's only one hour shorter for me to fly to L.A. than it is to London, so it's <laughs> kind of strange. Yeah. But I, I definitely enjoy both. I like the contrast going back and forth. That's what I think, actually, yes. Jose, you visited the new school for jazz and contemporary music in New York City. So what would you say um, was the most important thing or were the most important things you learned from that time? Well, uh, at that time, um, the founder, or I should say the co-founder, of the school, Chico Hamilton, the legendary jazz drummer, he was still there and he was uh, giving lessons. And so I was able to take lessons with him, which was amazing. He used to play with Lena Horn, the great jazz singer. He played with her for four years. And he said, he's like, Jose, I used to sit behind her every night and after a certain point, I knew exactly what she was gonna sing by the way her neck moved. It was like crazy, you know? Um, and then, you know, Junior Mance, the, the legendary jazz and blues pianist, also had a class. And I was able to record with him and, and with Chico, too. And, you know, the stories that they told and, and the way they approached music have influenced me <clears throat> more than anybody, you know, because, you know, Junior would tell me about, like, Dinah Washington. Um, he played with Charlie Parker. You know, he played with... Johnny, everybody, you know what I mean? And and the way that they approached music was so definitive. You know, Chico Hamilton once told me, it's the first take that matters because all your emotion is in it, you know? He said the second take might technically be better, but you're, it's all about your intellect. You're thinking about mm, the first that's one. That's what happened actually now yeah. within the sessions of making the album with Billie Holiday songs. Exactly. He was and right. it, that's why I didn't tell the musicians what they were performing before this, this session. They had no idea, you know, because I didn't want them to think about it. And like Miles Davis did it with Kind of Blue. They walked in, what are we going to play? You know, and he would just, they would start playing music. And, you know, in order to do that, you need a fantastic band. Mm -hmm. You can't, it doesn't work with everybody. I'll tell you that. Let's end up with Billie Holiday again. So if you would have the opportunity to meet her nowadays, what would you say? What would you tell her? Would you, would you ask her? That's a great question. It's a difficult one, I know. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just, I would want to say thank you for, you know, changing my life and for inspiring people. Um, all around the world, you know, everywhere I go, talking about this album, everybody's face lights up. They're like, Billie Holiday, you know? And, you know, it's been some of the, the most inspired uh, conversations around her. And, I, you know, I would just want to tell her that everything she did, um, you know, for black people and really for all people, for women, everything that she stood for, it, it made a big difference, you know? Um, I don't think I'd have the courage to ask her anything. <laughs> you know, the only thing I would want to do is uh, hear her sing just anything, you know, because there's so much knowledge in her voice and in the way she delivers a lyric that, for me, I know I'm going to be studying that for the rest of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, Jose James, thank you so much.
Thanks for having the opportunity to ask you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming here. Thank All the best guys. with the album, on tour, and for the next project. Wicked.